Good morning. Welcome to Oak Ridge Wesleyan Church. It is so good to be with you today. And maybe some of you are already sugared up. I'm not sure. Did anyone already eat their baked goods from the kids and teen? Oh, okay, we got a couple that are willing to admit you have already indulged in the goodness that is the teen and youth camp fundraiser bake sale out there. Well, we thank you and uh, thank you already for supporting our teens and youth and their endeavors to raise um, some scholarship funds for camp this year. These slides might be out of order this morning, so I won't talk too much more about it. We'll get to a little bit more detail on what's going on this week with their fundraising with camp in just a moment, because I think that slide's coming up, and I need to stay on track. So we want to welcome you. I'm going to go back to service this morning. Wow. I tell you, when you're working with teens and kids and baked goods all in the morning, you get a little bit flustered. I'm going to take a deep breath and begin again. Good morning. All right. So glad that you have joined us for worship today. I am Pastor Christia. If I have not yet met you this morning, I apologize. I would love to meet you um, after service today. But welcome to Oak Ridge Wesleyan Church. We do have a way of connecting with you throughout the week. Um, of course, you can come and talk to us anytime before or after service. If you would like to connect with us during the week at some point or get together, um, there are blue connect cards in the seat in front of you. This is our main way of connecting with you on Sunday mornings, and you can um, introduce yourself if you're a guest with us via this card. You can fill out a, a prayer request. Um, you can put a prayer request on there. We'd love to pray for you this week, and um, if you want it on the prayer chain, we can do that as well. If you'd like to get together for a meal or coffee, go ahead and fill out the back of the Connect card. You can turn those in to myself afterwards, or when you um, give or leave, there are plates for giving for our tithes and offering at the exit doors to the building. You can leave them in there as well, and they will make their way back to us. So we want to make sure that you know that we want to connect with you here at Oak Ridge. We have a couple of things we want to share with you. First, um, if you're a guest with us, you probably don't know anything about this, but we are trying to keep our cool here at Oak Ridge Wesleyan Church. And the meaning of that is, is we have one of our AC units um, that cools this area that you were just in. Our fellowship area and our kids areas is on the fritz. Right now we have a temporary Band-Aid on there that we not, we're not sure how long it'll last. Long story short, we began fundraising a few weeks ago. We have approved a um, AC company that's going to come and do it. It's actually a bivocational pastor in our district, which is super awesome that we get to support him. Um, the timeline on it is a little bit crunch, but it's a blessing because he quoted 4,000 less than what we originally thought we would have to pay for the AC. It's also going to be able to be done in a fraction of the time than we thought originally had thought because the equipment will come in quicker and so instead of two to three months in the middle of the summer possibly losing our cool we'll be able to keep our cool um so you're probably wondering where are we at with everything uh, we had shared with you I think we had shared with you last week we were up to ten thousand two hundred and twenty dollars towards our sixteen thousand dollar goal I'm very happy to share with you that the district loves our church still. And <laughs> they love us, they support us, they pray for us, and uh, we reached out to them. And due to their generosity, we are now at $13,220 towards our $16,000 go goal. Praise the Lord. God is so good. And so <clears throat> we are celebrating that today. We believe that we're going to get there within the next week or two. Uh, we totally believe that and that we'll be keeping our cool this summer and beyond. So we're very excited. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your prayers and for uh, contributing towards that. Um, we have this Friday, we are going to go to the ballpark at, for the Clearwater Threshers game. This Friday, gates open at 5.30. Um, the game begins at 6.30. I have a few tickets left. Today is the last Sunday to purchase said tickets. Parking costs $5 in addition to your ticket, but your $14.50 ticket includes the game, and it also includes all-you-can-eat concessions from 5.30 to 8 p.m. So if you have signed up and haven't purchased your ticket, or you haven't signed up but would like a ticket, 
see me afterwards. I have them in hand and we'll be able to exchange uh, cash or check with a ticket and wristband for your food today. It's going to be a fantastic week time. We have over 30 people going. It's going to be a great time together um, this Friday. After that, we're going to have a For Life Fest. We're combining Walk for Life and doing it here in, along in conjunction with our postal food drive. So the steps that we take, retrieving bags, bringing bags back, sorting bags, and putting items into boxes will serve as our steps for Walk for Life as kind of a collaborative effort. Um, New Life Solutions absolutely love this idea, and so we hope that you'll join us. The official time has been selected out of 9 a.m. on Saturday May 13th. So if you can come at 9 a.m., if you could come a little bit later and jump in, that would be great. Lunch will be provided, so any help is greatly appreciated that day. And then actually, uh, yeah, the week prior to that, I'm out of order, May 7th is going to be our Celebration Sunday with local church conference. We're going to celebrate all the amazing things that God has done over the past year here and through our church family, and we're going to appreciate our volunteers and have a taco bar, a fiesta to celebrate what God has done. So we're super, and then you'll have a siesta probably afterwards. But that's going to be on May 7th, so we're looking forward to that. Our uh, camp fundraisers, as, we, as I had mentioned, they got kicked off today. This is the one week that we will ask for funds for camp. Um, it'll, it starts today, ends next Sunday. The bake sale is donation-based, so whatever you think is fair, whatever you were able to bring today, if you forgot money today, you want to give it next week, that's fine too. But go ahead and support the teens and kids today at that. This Wednesday, there is going to be a spirit night at Tijuana Flats just down the road on Seminole Boulevard. We want you to eat some tacos again, um, but sooner this Wednesday from 5 to 8 there. You mentioned the flyer, bring it with you, and 20% comes back to our youth group and our children's ministry for camp. Um, they will be serving the church by doing some chores and some things around the building Wednesday night, and we'll wrap up next week. They'll be participating in service and be serving up a soup and salad luncheon after service next week. So lots to look forward to. Um, if you are able to, and God lays it on your heart, to give towards camp this year um, on your check or envelope, however you give, just put the word camp. We'll know what you mean. So we greatly appreciate your support of our next generation, and... We're going to go ahead and stand this morning as we prepare our hearts for worship through song. And the worship team can come forward, and I'm just going to say a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are just so thankful to gather in your name today, to gather together as your body, as your family, as brothers and sisters in Christ, and, and to be able to have fun, <laughs> to eat, to support one another, to hug and encourage one another, to lift one another up in prayer. God, you've created us to be in relationship with you and relationship with others, and, and not just one that's that's basic, but one that's growing, that's dynamic, that's, that's just a passionate relationship. And so, God, I just pray that we would fall more in love with you today, that we would continue to be bonded together as a church family through your love for us. God, I, I know that Everyone here came in in a different state of mind and a different uh, step in, in life and what they're facing. And so, God, I just ask that in these moments, myself included, that we would just surrender it all to you. That we would pause and stop the racing thoughts, stop the wandering mind, and focus on you, Jesus. As we enter this time of worship through song, and prayer, and listening to your word. God, would you just help us to fall more in love with you today? Help what we do and say and sing to be honoring to you, to glorify you, to magnify you. God, we ask that you would be magnified in our lives above all other things today. We are so excited to be here to worship and to praise you we just ask for more of you, Jesus, in our lives, in our worship, in our hearts, in our community, God. Give us Jesus today. And it's in your name I pray. Amen.
Think about how desperately our God loves us. Even in our failures, our weaknesses, our temptations, our doubts, our fears, our mistakes and mess ups, our God loves us. You would bear my cross for me. Because God looked at human beings that he'd made in his image, and he was not content to let them go the way that their sin was pulling. So God, this morning, help us just to sit in your presence to know that the Savior that we serve is risen and alive, that your Holy Spirit is here and is available. And so, God, for this time and this moment, can we just turn out the world and tune in to you, to be reminded that you are here, that whatever the this is that we walked in with, you have this, God. You love us, and you're present with us today. Thank you for
want to invite you as we sing this next song. If you feel so led, you're welcome to come to the altars and kneel as we uh, sing, and we'll have a moment of prayer together as a church family. Almighty God, we praise you this morning. God, even though you are unseen, we can't physically see you standing, sitting before us this morning. We know you are here. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit that is in our midst, that lives within those who follow you, for within those who choose to follow Jesus. God, we thank you that you are not absent, but you are present. That you are immovable, you are unshakable. That whatever it is that we face in this life, God, it is nothing to you. All it takes is faith as small as a mustard seed. To do great things in your name through your power that equips, calls, moves us, that empowers us to do great things for your sake. God, today you are a reason why we are here. You are the reason why we do what we do. It's not for power. It's not for personal gain. It's not for money. It's not for fame. It's, it's not even for others. It's, it's for you. What we do is, is because of you. Help us to reflect you 
to those around us more and more. God, help us to be your light in a world that often feels dark. God, you don't have to, we don't have to uh, do much to see the turmoil that is in our world for some of us in our very own lives. But God, you promise that you're there with us. And so today, God, I pray that you would help us to sense your presence. God, I pray that you would move in our lives, that we would feel the hand of God in our situations, that we would feel the comfort that you offer to us, that we would lean into that and that we would just sense your presence and maybe the answers that we would like to see answered won't be answered right away, but God, you are all-knowing and all-powerful and you work together all things for good to for those who love you. You are, you know everything, you know behind the scenes, you know the future, you know our past, and you are wise. So God, help us to relinquish control. Help us to stop making the demands and instead just place our lives completely in your hands today. God, we commit our lives to you. We commit what we do to you. God, help us to be your agents of hope and peace in the world that surrounds us, in our families, in our places of employment, in our neighborhoods, in our community, and in our world. God, you can use us to bring Jesus, the light of life, into our world. So I pray that we would not hold back, that we would not be timid, but that we would step forth in great boldness and courage to share the truth and the hope of Jesus Christ with others. God, I know that there's several different things going on in our church family, and financially, and relationship, and, and with our jobs, and free, and within marriages and all sorts of different things, God. I, I know they're out there, even if I'm not aware of specifics. And so, God, I pray that for our families. I pray for our marriages. I pray for those that are in the workplace, God. I just pray that you would encourage them. Help them to be like you in those situations. Help them to place you as priority in those situations in their life. God, I know there's a lot of physical um ailments in our that are represented in our church body today i i thank you for being with pastor craig and helping him this week to take some steps of progress god we pray that you would continue to help him and and his wife eileen not feeling 100 percent today i pray that you would help her to feel better to feel your healing touch today encourage them both god we we praise you that um, you worked in Carolyn's life this week and, and brought her to a place of where she can get some help for her heart. And, and we're just so thankful she's here this morning and is on the right track to getting some help. And so we're so thankful that your hand was with her and upon her. God, we, we know that there's so many different things going on. We also think of um, Andy in a few weeks in June. June 15th, he's going to be going in for some testing, and he might be placed on a kidney uh, uh, um, kidney transplant list, God, and so we ask that you would go before him there, too, and that you would be with those tests, and that you would help if he gets on that list, God, that you would bring someone sooner than later that would be able to help him to be on the road to um, a better health and a better life and a better way of living and serving you, God. God, for those things that I might have missed this morning, I just pray that your healing hand would be upon them, that you would bring answers and doctors and medicine and whatever they need today, God, that you would help them, heal them. But most of all, God, that they would seek you and feel your presence and comfort in the journey that you have them on, God, and that they would trust in you. God, be with our service today as we continue to worship you and to praise you through song. God, open up our hearts and our ears to your word and what you have to say to us today. Help it to be a life-transforming day for some of us today, where we will be able to take greater steps of faith towards you in a relationship with you. We love you. We magnify your name. And it's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Walking around. 
feel like the Israelites as we've seen you in the past and we've seen great movements of God and we've heard these stories from generations that have gone before and we find ourselves in our Jericho moment walking around the walls and wondering what on earth is God doing why is this taking so long? Why is what I'm praying for not happening yet? I don't understand why people are leading me this way or what God is up to. And yet, 
our God never fails. He is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. The God who has been with us and with those who have gone before us, he is here today and he is moving and he has a kingdom and kingdom power that he desires to see come into our lives and our world and our family and our community. And so, Jesus, some of us find ourselves in the mid of, midst of a night wondering, when is it going to go? When is it going to pass? But God, there is hope in Jesus. Sometimes Friday looks dark. But may we never forget that Sunday is coming. May we never forget that our God has a plan. And the God that we have seen move, the God that we have heard move, the God who has worked miracles in the past can do it again. And so today, God, we simply open ourselves up before you and say, do in our lives as you will. Allow us to see the good, strong, present, and powerful hand of God in our lives and in our church. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated this morning, congregation. We want to remind you that you have the opportunity to give in worship through the giving of your tithes and your offerings this morning. Uh, there are plates that are available as you exit either the back door here or head out the main door this way. You can also give online at oakridgewc.com slash give. If you are giving a special gift this morning beyond your tithes and offerings to either uh, our kids or the AC fundraiser, make sure you clearly indicate that. And we want to have a moment to pray over our offering this morning. Jesus, we thank you for your provision in our lives. We thank you for how you take care of us, and, and you are our Jehovah Jireh, Lord. And God, I pray that you would uh, continue to be with us as your church this morning. God, I pray for the funds that are given, that you would give wisdom to our leadership, God, that we would spend funds in a way that would honor you, that would grow your kingdom, and that would expand the work that you want to do in our community, Lord Jesus. We pray also for those who give this morning, God, that you would bless them and their families, that you would continue to provide, and as they are faithful to giving to you, God, may they see an increase and an abundance that comes from your good hands, God. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to go ahead at this time, and any of our children up through fifth grade that are a part of Adventure Kids or their volunteers, we want to go ahead and dismiss you. I'm excited to be with you this morning as we continue this series that we started last week, looking at the life of a character in Scripture named Elisha, a man whose life was characterized by this almost ridiculous, if you will, faith. He had just crazy amounts of faith in God, and God showed up in his life in dramatic ways. We've kind of started by asking ourselves, what can I do to be a little bit more like Elisha? How can I be a person who has such strong faith in God that repeatedly in my life I can see him show up again and again and again? And last week we started, we kicked off our series looking at the calling story of Elisha. How was it that Elisha became prophet to Israel? And it started with obedience. It started with hearing the voice of God speaking into his life and being willing to obey what God had for him. We talked about several things and kind of the passing of the torch, if you will, from Elijah to Elisha in this calling story and kind of what that meant for us if God is going to speak into our lives, if we are going to be people of obedience, people who have faith in God that is displayed as obedience, it means that we have to be willing to obey the whispers, that God doesn't often speak in loud, audible voices, but we need to have margin space in our lives, silence in our lives where we can listen to him. 
God is calling us to know that there is more to life than what most of us settle for. Just getting up and doing the same thing today that we did yesterday, living to make money that eventually we pass on to somebody else. Obedience means being willing to pass the mantle, being willing to look for those who are coming behind us and look up to those who have gone before us and ask, who is it that God is asking me to pass on what I have known of him and who is it that has gone before me that I can learn from? And ultimately, when we hear God's voice speak into our lives, Elisha teaches us to burn the plows and kill the cows. He removes any temptation he has to go back to his old way of life and simply says, God, I am fully yours. Every possibility to return is gone. If you have a Bible in your hands this morning, maybe it's a paper Bible or a digital Bible, I'd invite you to get your Bible out at this time. If you need to borrow one, there's some Bibles in the chairs in front of you. You can grab one of those. I invite you to lift your Bible up nice and high and just say, I got my Bible, PJ. We are going to be in 2 Kings chapter 2 this morning. If you want to go ahead and and turn there, 2 Kings chapter 2. We'll get there in just a, a couple of moments. Today I want to talk about commitment. Faith is often displayed in our commitment. The dictionary would define it as the state or quality of being dedicated to someone or something, such as a cause or an activity. It creates this sense of obligation for us that restricts our ability to act in a manner that would contradict our allegiance or commitment. Commitments are generally choices we make to focus our energy, our attention, or our resources on a limited subject at the exclusion of other things. It means that we make the same choice, even when it's not always convenient. We zero in on one thing and say, this is what I'm about. Nothing else even comes into view. There's a story of a poor old woodcutter. One day he's cutting a branch that's a part of a tree over a river. And as he's cutting the branch to the tree, his axe falls into the river. And the poor woodcutter begins to cry and he, he's, he, he's sitting there on the riverbank and pouring out his heart and God comes to him and he says, why are you crying to the woodcutter? He says, well, I've dropped my axe into the river and the rapids are rushing strong. I can't swim and the axe is the only thing that I have to provide for me and my family. And so God goes down into the river and he comes out with a golden axe that he presents to the woodcutter and he says, is this your axe? And the woodcutter looks at it quickly and says, no, that is not my axe. So God goes down into the river again and he comes back up with a beautiful polished silver axe and he says to the woodcutter, is this your axe? The woodcutter says, no, that's not my axe. And so God goes down into the river again and he finds a well-worn old iron axe and he says, is this your axe? The woodcutter says, yes. That's my axe. And God is so pleased with the woodcutter's honesty that he says, you can have all three axes. Go home, be provided for, and the woodcutter leaves, and he is overjoyed at God's gift and graciousness to him. Several months later, he's walking with his wife, And they happen to be along the river bank when her ankle hits a root and she twists and she falls into the river and she is drowning, caught underneath the rapids and the woodcutter begins crying out and God appears again and says to him, why are you crying? The woodcutter says, my wife has fallen into the river and with the rapids, I can't swim, I can't save her. And so God goes down into the river and he comes out with former People magazine, most beautiful woman in the world, Jennifer Aniston. And he says to the woodcutter, is this your wife? And the woodcutter looks at her and says, yep, that's her. (laughs) And God is furious. You cheater, he says. And the woodcutter goes, wait, wait, hold on, God. If I had said no to Jennifer Aniston, you would have gone into the river and pulled out another beautiful woman. And if I had said no to her, you would have gone into the river and brought back my wife. God, I'm only a poor woodcutter. I can't afford to take care of three women. I had to say yes to the first one. 
true commitment means that we always make the same choice, even if it's not what's most convenient. Elisha was a man of God who displayed his faith through his unyielding commitment. And as we read his story this morning, we have to ask ourselves, how committed am I in this journey of life, this faith journey before God? Am I fully committed or only when it's convenient for me? So it's a bit of a longer story, but we're going to go ahead and, and read the story that we find in 2 Kings chapter 2. It starts at verse 1. It says, When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha, Elisha said, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. And the company of prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha and said, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elisha replied. Be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. And the company of the prophets at Jericho went up to Elisha and asked him, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, he replied. Be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here. The Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. And then fifty men from the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance, facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I'm taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You've asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet if you see me when I'm taken from you, it'll be yours, and otherwise it will not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this. He cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment and tore it in two. Elisha then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and he struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. When he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. The company of the prophets from Jericho who were watching said, The spirit of Elijah is arresting on Elisha. And they went to meet him and bowed down before him on the ground. Three things I notice as we read this story that I want to share with you this morning about what I think God would say to us it means to have ridiculous commitment, to have faith in our lives that is displayed as a commitment to God and His calling and His plan for our lives. And the first is this, don't give up. Commitment means that we don't give up. Elijah goes to three different places in this passage. He goes to Gilgal, he goes to Bethel, and he goes to Jericho before he ultimately crosses the Jordan. And each of these three places are known to being home to some kind of a, a guild, a prophetic guild that is there. And every time Elijah prepares to go to the next place, he says to Elisha, stay here, I'm going to go over there. You stay at this place and I will move on to the next place. And each time, Elisha replies to Elijah, No, as surely as the Lord God is alive, as surely as you are alive, I am not going to leave you. I'm not going to abandon you. I am going with you. While the passage doesn't uh, explicitly say it, I wonder if Elijah is testing Elisha with these questions. It's almost as if every time Elijah is moving on, he's saying to him, here is a guild of prophets. 
Elisha, if you don't want the job, I put the mantle on you. God was calling you. You have been the one following me. But Elisha, if it's gotten hard, if it's gotten difficult, if it's gotten scary, we're going to another place where there are prophets available. If you want out, you stay here. I'll move on and I'll find somebody else to take your place. And every single time that Elijah turns to Elisha and says, you stay here and gives him the temptation, gives him the out, Elisha says, no, as surely as God is alive and as you are alive, I know what God has spoken into my life. You are the prophet that I have watched and heard of. I know that I am meant to take your place. I will not leave you. I will follow you. Sometimes there's a temptation in life to commit to something. But later on, as we go through the journey of life, things get difficult or hard or maybe just boring. And we want out of the commitment that we've made. Some of us sometimes even feel trapped by the commitments that we've made in our past. Several years ago, my family had season passes to SeaWorld. And we went there, the the three of us and also my parents were at SeaWorld. And uh, we rode all kinds of rides and saw animal shows. And we had a a very full day. But there was one particular ride, which is still my favorite ride at SeaWorld, called Manta. And in case you haven't ridden Manta, what makes it really unique is that when you get on the ride, you kind of sit down and they strap you in. And then they rotate you 90 degrees backwards. And you ride this ride kind of feeling like Superman or a manta ray swimming through the ocean. It is a ridiculously fun ride. So we'd been through SeaWorld and we'd had a a busy day and everybody was kind of tired and it was the end of the day and we walked past the ride and I was kind of begging, I really want to ride the ride one more time. And some of the rest of the family, they were tired, they didn't want to ride a ride, but there was a gift shop nearby. And they said, well, we'll go in the gift shop for a few minutes. It only says five minutes wait, you go ahead and get on the ride. So I went through the line, and sure enough, the line was short. I pretty much got right on, got strapped into the ride, was absolutely committed, and I went off to have a good time. Now, if you've ever ridden Manta, there's one part about the ride that's not enjoyable. That's when it's completely over, and you're still hung 90 degrees backward, and the blood is rushing to your head, and you begin to hurt a little bit as you're laying on your chest, waiting for them to let you down. Well, I had gotten on the ride, I had went and done all my flips and had fun, and I got to that point and I was just kind of getting anxious, like, okay, everybody's at the the gift shop, they're waiting for me, and we came back into the house where they're supposed to kind of let you down and off the ride, except it didn't come down. And I was stuck there, blood rushing to my head, and I'm beginning to have all of these thoughts of, this hurts. I'm beginning to panic a little bit, like I want out of this situation. I'm trying to reach for my phone, but I'm strapped in, and I'm like, I can't even call anybody. They want to leave and go home. And for 30 to 45 minutes, I hung there on Manta going, I committed to this ride, but I would do anything to get out of the situation that I'm in. Sometimes life feels that way. We commit to something because in the beginning it looks like it's going to be fun. It's going to be enjoyable. We are really going to like this thing that we are committing to. And for a while the ride it is. It's everything that we thought it would be. But then we reach a moment where we go, this hurts. I still feel strapped in, but this isn't comfortable anymore. I'm not enjoying this. And maybe even the people that I, I are, are part of my life, maybe I'm causing them pain by this commitment that I've made. I would do anything to get out of this. I'm not sure what commitments maybe you've made to God or for God. Sometimes one of the best ways that we can allow God to show up radically in our lives, that we can be people of faith, is simply to stay committed even when it gets tough, even when the marriage feels dry and it's not as fun as it used to be and we're arguing a little bit, 
It's not time to give up. Maybe time for counseling or mentoring. When volunteering at the church doesn't give us the same sense of emotional satisfaction that it did when we first started. When we fail to see spiritual hunger in the people that we've been praying for. When we're watching those around us seem to live immoral lives and experience something that we feel like maybe I'm missing out on. When the ministry or the business venture that we felt like God led us to just isn't bearing the fruit we wanted it to yet. The reason that God uses the ridiculously committed is not because, not only because he knows they can be trusted, but because they've hung on long enough and patiently enough to see the work of God in their lives. English theologian and historian Thomas Fuller once famously wrote in his 1650 travelogue, the night is always darkest just before the dawn. Elisha had opportunities. He had moments early in this journey after he'd burned the, burned the plows, killed the cows. He'd, he'd left and said, I'm committed to God. And Elijah wanted to make sure that he knew what he was signing up for. Are you really willing to go through everything? There will be moments in your life where life is hard and tough, and you may look for the exits and you may see them, and they may look clear, and they may seem really attractive compared to the pain of whatever you strapped into. But sometimes, God simply wants us to display our faith by not giving up, by saying, God, I still want to see. Elisha signed up to follow Elijah because he believed that he was going to see God show up and do something in his life. His name means God is salvation, and he believed that God was going to help bring salvation through him if only he would hang on. I don't know what God may bring in your life, but there's something good for people of faith when we trust God and we don't give up even when it's difficult. Second thing that I think God would say to us this morning is to ask big. In verse 9, Elisha has the audacity to ask Elijah for a double portion of his spirit. There's a couple different ways that we can maybe understand this. Bible scholars kind of debate two possible ways of understanding. One is that when Elisha asks for a double portion of God's spirit, it's interesting. If you read the accounts of Elijah and you start to count the miracles that happen in Elijah's life, and then you read the story of Elisha and you count the miracles that happen in Elisha's life, depending exactly on how you count, there's twice as many miracles in Elisha's life as there is in Elijah's life. The other thought is, comes from Deuteronomy 21.17 and refers to inheritance law. The firstborn son was to receive a double portion of his father's possessions. Personally, this is what I think Elisha is asking for. But either way you take it, Elisha is saying, I recognize that God has been with you, Elijah. I recognize that God has been moving in your life, and I want to see that in my life. Either I want to see double what you've seen, or more likely, as you move on as a prophet, and as God's Spirit moves in other prophets, I want the double portion. I want the firstborn son's rights. I want to step into the role that you have had, Elijah. As you have been God's prophet, I am ready to for that role. Elisha is very kingdom-minded in his request to his mentor. He doesn't ask for material wealth or popularity or safety or physical health or earthly power or glory. He says, God, I want you to show up in my life in a really big way. You ever ask God to show up in your life in a really big way? I think sometimes we're afraid to ask big when we pray. And sometimes our prayers are stuck in the kind of superficial things that Elisha doesn't ask for. God, I want to pray for a really big house. God, I want to pray for a really big healing miracle for me. God, I want to pray for a really big job. God, I'm not married and I really, really want that really attractive person that I know. But Elisha prayed for a kingdom-minded ask. God, I want to see you show up in my life and use me in crazy and big ways. And I think there's two reasons why we don't sometimes ask God for big things. 
Sometimes we don't ask God to show up in a big way because we're afraid He won't do it. We struggle with self-esteem and confidence on a regular basis. And we wonder if we're enough for God to use us. Confession time. As your pastor, I struggle here all the time. Feeling like I don't know if I can do what God has. And it seems scary to ask God to use me because I just don't know if he's going to show up and use me if I step out in faith. Many of us, I wonder, if we've ever felt a nudge from God to ask him for something, to pray, to share our faith, to volunteer at church, to go on a missions trip or serve in some redemptive capacity in our community, to start a Bible study with our friends or our neighbors, to even let our coworkers know that we go to church but we're afraid that God won't show up. We're afraid it's all on me. And and I feel small and I feel inadequate. I maybe don't feel like a Bible scholar or a theologian. And so we're afraid to ask God to show up in a big way because we're just afraid He won't. Some of us write off God's ability to use us before we ever seek Him. Not because of a self-esteem issue, but Other issues where we feel like God really can't do much with my life. I'm too old or too young. I'm too busy. There's some issue in my family or my finances or my health. So often we fail to ask God for big things because we're afraid He won't show up. Some of us, on the other hand, we're afraid to ask God for big things, not because we're afraid He won't show up. We're afraid He will. We're afraid that God is going to do something big in our life, and that is what scares us. It's like we've heard missionaries get on a stage and say, the last place that I ever wanted to go was rural Nepal, and that's where God called me. And we're like, if I give my life to God and ask Him to do big things, He's going to make me eat bugs in some third world country, and I don't want to do it. Firstly, God will never call you to something without giving you a heart for what he's called you to. He will use that experience to shape you for something greater. He's a good father with plans to prosper you and not to harm you. And secondarily, your life will always be more miserable chasing the comforts of this world, the security of this world, then it will ever be laying it down for something greater in the kingdom of God. Being willing to ask God to do something big is kind of like an investment. It's saying that I believe that if I commit my life to God, it may cost me in the short term. There are things I may have to sacrifice now, but there is something greater waiting for me. Now, some of you are math people, so you'll like this illustration. Some of you aren't math people, and you'll hate it. But imagine I was to tell you that I will give you $20 today, but every day for the next month, you owe me $1. That's investment option A. I'll give you 20 bucks today, but you owe me a dollar a day for the next month. Or I could tell you, you owe me a dollar a day for the next month. And at the end of that month, I'm going to give you $40. Now the reality is, in option A, you end up losing about $10. In option B, you end up gaining about $10. But so many of us choose option A with our lives. We come to God and we say, God, bless me now. Give me what I want in this moment. I'll make it up to you later, God. If only you give me what I want, I promise I'll be at church every Sunday and serve with kids. And God is calling us to say, will you be committed now? God, I don't know what you have for me, but I will serve in church every Sunday with kids. And I will be there faithfully working for you in your kingdom. And somewhere along the journey, show me what you want to do. And somewhere years later, there's that kid who comes back and says, I know Jesus because of you, because of the work that you've done in my life. So much better than the early blessing and the long-term payoff is to say, God, I'm committed, just show up. And when you're ready, 
I want to see your hand. Elijah gave his, his protege the opportunity to get off, but Elisha, he was willing to ask God for big things because he was committed. He said, I know that God has worked in Elijah's life, and I want to see what God can do in my life. And so, God, I'm, I'm here, and I'm willing. And Elijah, if you want to give something to me, if there's anything you can give me, I want the firstborn son's rights. I want the double portion of the spirit that you have, that I can see God in my life as you've seen God in yours. The third thing that I think God would tell us from Elisha's story this morning is that we need to take responsibility. Elisha's faith gives him the commitment to not give up and to ask big. And in his life, as we will understand as we read more and more of it, he gets to witness some pretty neat things. He sees some pretty crazy things here, even in the final moments of Elijah's life. Elijah's life parallels Moses' life in many ways. Here at the end of his life, God uses him to part the waters of the Jordan River, just as Moses parted the Red Sea. The two men are separated by chariots of horses and fire, and then a whirlwind takes Elijah to heaven just east of the Jordan, outside the land of Israel approximately the same place that Deuteronomy 34 records that the Lord himself had buried Moses. And after this, Elisha picks up Elijah's cloak and uses it to divide the waters to cross back into the land of Israel, right near the place where Joshua would have crossed the promised land with the Israelites. Symbolic of the Spirit of God that was with Elijah has now indeed been passed to Elisha. Stories in Scripture often have a sort of skipping stone effect. Similar things that happen at one point happen again and again. What God has done, he can do again. Moses to Joshua, Elijah to Elisha, John the Baptist to Jesus, and Jesus to the apostles all play similarly in parts. Remember, even the names are somewhat familiar. Joshua, Elisha, Jesus all essentially mean God is salvation. Each of these three is involved in a dramatic passing of the spiritual baton of leadership from one to another. Here in the moment that Elijah passes the baton to Elisha, we see fire and wind. Just as on the day of Pentecost, the disciples are in the upper room praying and there's tongues of fire and a raging wind that blows through the house. Elisha, at this moment, is standing there having witnessed God's last great miracle in Elijah's life. And the cloak lays at his feet. And there's a decision to make. This is that final moment. You've followed Elijah to the last point that he could possibly be with you. You said you were sticking with him all through it. You wanted to see God do dramatic things. Elijah Elijah is now gone, and the cloak is there. What will you do? And Elisha bends down, picks up the cloak, and does exactly what he's seen his master do. He rolls up the cloak, he walks to the river, he touches the river and watches it part to the left and right, and he takes responsibility to say, now the Spirit of God that was on Elijah is on me. Just like the disciples who gathered together in an upper room saying, we will not abandon you, Jesus. We will wait for the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes, Jesus' words to them was, you will do greater things than you have seen me do. Just as Elisha had done greater things than Elijah had done. And God in your life, as he calls you, wants to know, are you willing to take up the mantle of responsibility and place that upon yourself. Anytime we follow God's prompting, there's that moment of responsibility. When you get down on one knee and propose to the girlfriend you've been dating for a long time, the first Sunday that you actually serve in the kids' ministry, when you hold a newborn baby in your arms for the first time, those moments you have every, in your home before everyone arrives to the Bible study that you've invited your friends and neighbors to. The moment the flight takes off for the missions trip that you signed up for. 
the moment the coworker walks into the lunchroom and says, hey, I see you reading your Bible in here sometimes. What's up with that? Are you one of those Jesus freaks? You have these moments in life where everything hinges. The question is, what are you going to do in that moment? Will you be faithful to pick up the cloak that has been laid before you? Willing to commit to God and see where He leads from here. To jump in all the way, forsaking every other option, and go where God takes you. God will never force you to bend down and pick up the cloak. It's your choice to make. To say, do I really believe that the God who has gone before me, the God who I've heard the stories of those who have gone before me, do I really believe that the God who has done it before can do it again? That the immortal, invisible, only wise, supreme being of the universe is here? Do I believe that he loves me, has a plan and a purpose for my life? And though it is scary, and though it might cost me something in the short term, am I willing to be a person of faith who picks up the mantle that has been laid before me and says, God, I will commit to you no matter what. I'm not looking for the out. I'm only believing that if I continue to serve you, I will see you show up and do in my life what I've seen and heard you do before. God worked powerfully through the prophet Elisha because of his faith and his commitment. He didn't give up. He asked God for big things. And when the moment came, he took the responsibility on himself. Let me pray for you this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning for the example that you give us in the life of Elisha. The example of faith. And God, the truth is, the skipping stone effect that has happened from Moses and Joshua, Elijah, Elisha, Jesus and the first apostles stands before us this morning. God, your Holy Spirit is here and in this place. And I cannot and do not know what you have whispered or may whisper to each individual here in our lives. What you may ask us to do to serve in your kingdom how you are calling us to be a part of what you are doing that is so much bigger than just what the kingdoms of this world tell us life is all about. God, I believe you have good things for us. I believe you want to show up in powerful ways. You want us to see your hand working. But we have to be people of faith, people who are willing to obey when you call, and people who are committed to staying with you and to allowing you, God, to have your will in our lives. So God, even before we know what the question is, may we be people who say yes. God, whatever you want, whatever you ask, whatever you give before me, I will do. God, give us eyes to see those who are ahead of us. Give us courage to take the mantle upon ourselves to ask you for big things and to believe that if we never give up, we will see God show up in our lives. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name I pray. Amen. I want to remind you this morning of the opportunity to give tithes and offerings as you exit. Um, also, you can give online at oakridgewc.com slash give. Our kids and teens, I believe, are waiting for you out in the meet and greet with some more treats, so make sure you uh, grab some of those on your way out. You can make a donation today if you have it. If you don't have it and you're planning to make a donation later in the week towards teen camp, that's perfectly fine. Uh, go ahead and take some of those sweet treats. We don't need a bunch of them left here. Make sure you bring something home. And uh, again, don't forget Wednesday we have uh, Taco Night at Tijuana Flats, and next week will be another awesome opportunity for our teens to be involved in service. 